Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm Ben Powell. I'm the director of the Free Market Institute here at Texas Tech University. Uh, the Free Market Institute was founded almost 10 years ago here to promote the teaching and study of uh, free markets and the institutional environment in which they operate in. And uh, among the many things we do is to promote a public lecture series here on campus where we bring distinguished authors and public intellectuals uh, through to talk about their work. And I'm very happy with the event that we have tonight. But before I introduce Dr. Holcomb, I will also advertise for our next event coming up. We're going to have Jason Riley, who's a member of the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal, uh, and an editorial columnist there, uh, who wrote a book on Thomas Sowell, his biography, and he's going to be talking on why Tom Sowell matters, race inequality, and the role of public intellectuals. That will be next month here, Monday, April 25th. Uh, it won't be in this building. It'll be over at the McKenzie Market Center on the, what's that, southeast corner of campus. Uh, we hope you'll be able to join for that. For tonight, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Randall Holcomb, who is going to talk about the rise of political capitalism. Randy Holcomb is the DeVoe Moore Professor of Economics at Florida State University and a senior fellow at the James Madison Institute and the Independent Institute. He's also a research fellow at the Law and Economics Center at George Mason University. Dr. Holcomb received his PhD from Virginia Tech, and before he went to Florida State, he taught at Auburn and at Texas A&M, or uh, I shouldn't have even mentioned that, sorry guys, uh, but at some other university in Texas. Uh, he, despite, despite that earlier dilettance with another university in Texas. This is his third time visiting us at, at Texas Tech University. And uh, on one of his prior visits, he uh, proved that he was a better Texas Tech football fan than I was. Uh, we attended a game together after one of his talks. And uh, this was back when the stadium was dry. Patrick Mahomes was here, but we weren't winning somehow. Uh, and somewhere through the fourth quarter, I said, I'm going to go to the bar across the street. And he says, no, no, I don't leave until the game's all the way over. And he stayed till the end of the game and then met me afterwards. Uh, in addition to his uh, academic appointments, uh, Dr. Holcomb also served on Florida Governor Jeb Bush Council of Economic Advisors from 2000 to 2006. He's a past president of the Public Choice Society and the Society for the Development of Austrian Economics. Uh, he's the author of 20 books and over 200 academic journal articles that have been cited by other scholars more than 10,000 times. Uh, and he's here to talk to us tonight about one of his recent books, uh, Political Capitalism, How Economic and Political Power is Made and Maintained. Please join me in welcoming Randy Holcomb. Thank you very much, Ben, for that introduction. I am delighted to be here and uh, sort of uh, remembering our football game, you know, start out saying, you know, guns up. Uh, so uh, my talk, again, political capitalism, here's a cover uh, of the book. And uh, speaking uh, for the Free Market Institute, a lot of proponents of free markets view creepy socialism uh, as a big threat to capitalism. And the message I'm going to try to, to put across today uh, is that while free market proponents are concerned about the threat of creeping socialism, meanwhile capitalism is being undermined from within. That capitalists uh, are the biggest threat <coughs> to capitalism. So I'm going to talk about this economic system of political capitalism, which I'm viewing as a distinct uh, political and economic system. Uh, that uh, with uh, political capitalism, uh, it's an economic and political system in which the economic and political elite cooperate for their mutual benefit. Uh, as political capitalism progresses, the profitability of business is determined by political connections more than by the satisfaction of consumer preferences. And uh, one reason why I think uh, we don't recognize so explicitly this system of political capitalism is that when we think about economic and political systems, uh, we're 
We're stuck in a Cold War mentality, a 20th century Cold War mentality of economic and political systems. Uh, this, in this Cold War way of thinking, well, that's not the slide I was expecting. Well, no. <clears throat> it seems like I'm missing a slide. Okay, so this Cold War uh, uh, way of thinking, the way we were viewing things in the Cold War era is we had capitalist democracies that were opposing communist dictatorships. And, and we viewed political and economic systems uh, as uh, independent of one another, that you could have any type of economic or political system uh, uh, going with each other. So we could have capitalist democracies, uh, but we could also have socialist democracies. Uh, and a lot of times people cited Sweden as an example of a socialist democracy. I think it's not a good example, but in that 20th century Cold War way of thinking, uh, people were thinking that way. I think I'm going to try to get my clock up here so I can keep time. So I don't want to go. Um, uh, I don't want to go too long. Um, <clears throat> so in this cold, in this Cold War way of thinking, we had two dimensions: a political dimension and an economic dimension. The economic dimension. We were going back and forth, but we, one extreme capitalism, the other extreme socialism, and then mixed economies in between. And in the political dimension, democracies, dictatorships, and more authoritarian uh, regimes uh, uh, in between. Uh, and political capitalism uh, is a distinct economic system. It's not a mixed economy. It's not some intermediate stage between capitalism and socialism. Uh, it's its own economy. Uh, and I think I had a couple of slides that didn't uh, show up there. Um, but uh, political capitalism is widely recognized. Uh, it hasn't gone by that name. People have talked about cronyism, uh, corporatism, favoritism, crony capitalism, fascism. President Eisenhower in 1960 when he was leaving office warned about the military industrial uh, complex. Uh, and so the system is, is widely recognized, it's widely opposed, but it's not widely understood. Um, uh, many people recognize the symptoms of political capitalism not many people understand the causes. It's not a mixed economy. It's not something between capitalism and socialism. It's a distinct uh, political and economic system. Well, this is a slide I was thinking was going to come up before. Um, well, let's skip over that. OK. Uh, so as I say, it's widely recognized. And I want to give you some examples here. And let me start out with, uh, with Marx and Engels. Uh, there, uh, this is in the Communist Manifesto. Each step in the development of the bourgeoisie was accompanied by a corresponding political advance of that class. The bourgeoisie has at last, since the establishment of modern industry in the world market, conquered for itself in the modern representative state exclusive political sway. The executive of the modern state is but a committee for managing the common affairs of the whole bourgeoisie. Uh, that's Marx and Engels uh, over on the uh, political left. Uh, on the political right, Murray Rothbard. Now, some of you may not be familiar with Murray Rothbard, but Murray Rothbard uh, is a libertarian anarchist. Uh, when you talk about uh, limited government, Rothbard says, too extreme, too far left. No government is the best type of government to have. Uh, so uh, so I, I brought him in as a contrast to Marx and Engels if we're thinking about the political extremes. And Rothbard, in his book, The Progressive Era, says increasing statism on a, uh, uh, on a federal and state level can be better interpreted as a profitable alliance between certain businesses and, and, and industrial interests, looking for government to cartelize their industry. Uh, and Rothbard, again, in his book, The Progressive Era, uh, it says the Progressive Era uh, recreated the age-old alliance between big government, large business firms, and opinion-molding intellectuals. Power was shifted out of the hands of the masses and into the hands of a minority elite of technocrats 
and upper income businessmen. And I want to emphasize Rothbard's pointing out here that distinction between the elite, who basically run things, and that's what Marx and Engels were saying, uh, and, uh, and, and, and the masses. Uh, so, as I say, the system was widely recognized. Uh, here's Tom Morello. He's a guitarist for uh, Rage Against the Machine. Uh, in a Guitar World interview, well, where did Morello go? There he is. <clears throat> Uh, the government basically has one function, and that function is to serve the interests of the people who own the country. Uh, so we see, you know, from one end of the political spectrum to another. Uh, and, and, and let me uh, bring out some views of, of other people. And this is Joseph Stiglitz in his book, The Price of Inequality, published in 2012. Uh, Stiglitz, who is on the political left, um, I don't think many people would disagree with that. Uh, Stiglitz says, we have a political system that gives inordinate power to those at the top. Uh, and they have used that power not only to limit the extent of redistribution, but also shape the rules of the game in their favor. And, and then uh, uh, later on, and I really like this quote, it's one thing to win a fair game. It's quite another to be able to write the rules of the game and write them in ways that enhance one's prospect of winning. And it's even worse when you can choose your own referees. That's uh, Stiglitz on the political left. On the political right, here's David Stockman. Uh, David Stockman was the budget director under Ronald Reagan and before that was a U.S. congressman. Uh, and this is in his book, The Great Deformation, written about the same time as Stiglitz's book. We have a rigged system a regime of crony capitalism. In truth, the historic boundary between the free market and the state has been eradicated, and therefore, anything that can be peddled by crony capitalists is fair game. So, on the left, on the right, Stiglitz and Stockman agree. Uh, up until the conclusion, the policy recommendations of their book, <laughs> the, the books are, are, are close to, to interchangeable. Stiglitz says, when one interest group holds too much power, it succeeds in getting policies that benefit itself rather than policies that would benefit society as a whole. When the wealthiest use their political power uh, uh, to benefit excessively the corporations they control, much needed revenues are diverted into the pockets of a few instead of benefiting society at large. There's that division between elites and masses. And Stockman, over on the political right, our government is no longer a system of democratic choice uh, and governance. It is a tyranny of incumbency and money politics. The gangs of crony capitalism will fight tooth and nail to preserve their slice of an imperial pie, thereby disenfranchising even further ordinary taxpayers and citizens who have no voice uh, in uh, Washington policy actions. Uh, so, so we see uh, in the analysis that's taken place I say over more than a century, because we went back to Marx and Engels uh, uh, to start, over more than a century, uh, I think perceptive analysis analysts who have seen the issues divide people into two groups. Uh, there's the cronies, and then there's everybody else. Different people have given different names to those groups. Uh, the bourgeoisie versus the proletariat, the elite versus the masses. More recently in the Occupy Wall Street movement, the 1% versus the 99%. And what was the complaint there of the, uh, of the Occupy Wall Street people? They were saying, here, the, the 2008 financial crisis, uh, the economy's gone into a tailspin, and the government comes in and it bails out those fat cat Wall Street bankers, and meanwhile people are getting evicted out of their homes and left to fend for themselves. The, the government is benefiting the 1%, not looking out for the interests of the 99%. Uh, now, uh, let me take a little bit of an academic turn uh, and mention that uh, the, the building blocks of political capitalism, we can find them in two strands of academic literature. There's elite theory, which has been developed mainly in sociology and political science, and as the quotations that I uh, read to you already indicate, this elite theory says, some people, the elite, there's a few people who, who benefit from uh, uh, manipulating the rules of the game, other people, the masses, 
those people are the people who often pay the price for the policies that benefit the elite. So elite theory tells us who benefits. And then there's public choice theory. Public choice theory uh, is a body of, uh, of academic literature that uses economic methods to analyze political processes. And public choice theory has uh, pointed out the rent seeking as people are looking for sp special interest benefits, regulatory capture as regulatory agencies tend to benefit the, the firms they regulate rather than look out for the general public interest, and interest group politics in general. So elite theory tells us who benefits. Uh, public choice theory tells us uh, why uh, uh, or how they benefit. And there's an economic foundation to elite theory that I try to develop in the book, uh, which is based on transaction costs. So some of you who have studied some economics will be familiar with the idea of transaction costs. But tra a transaction cost is anything that stands in the way of people engaging in mutually advantageous exchange. So when transaction costs are low, people can exchange for their mutual benefit. When transaction costs are high, High transaction costs stand in the way of people engaging in mutually advantageous exchange. And we can use that transaction cost theory as a basis for elite theory. There are a few people, the elite, those people bargain to make public policy. The nucleus of the elite is the legislature. Uh, there are also well-connected lobbyists corporate CEOs, those people have access to each other, those people negotiate and bargain to make public policy. Most people are in the masses. Those people face high transaction costs, so they are unable to bargain to influence public policy. I'm part of the masses. Many of you, probably most of you, part of the masses. I mean, if you want to affect public policy, how can you do that? Basically, we, we, we have no voice as individuals. Uh, that public policy is designed by an elite, those people with low transaction costs, who bargain with each other to create public policy. And the masses are simply subject to uh, the, the, the uh, policies that are passed by the elite. So that transaction cost theory helps us to understand why there are these two groups in society. So basically, applying transaction costs, the bourgeoisie, the elite, the 1%, those are the fat cats who are in the low transaction cost group. The proletariat, the masses, the 99%, those are the people who face high transaction costs, and so they're unable to negotiate to, uh, to create public policy. So public choice theory uh, tells us Here's how people can benefit uh, by using government policies to their advantage and often imposing costs on other people. But where public choice theories come up a little bit short is it, it, is it hasn't really emphasized that there's a small group of people who benefit from the rent seeking, from the regulatory capture, from the uh, interest group politics. Those are the elite, the people who face low transaction costs. Uh, most people face high transaction costs. They're excluded from political bargaining to create public policy. <clears throat> There's a discontinuity in political power. Uh, some people face low transaction costs. They participate in the making of public policy. Most people face high transaction costs. Uh, they have no say in the, the uh, creation of public policy. Uh, the problem is that, that for people in the masses, your one vote doesn't count. Now, it's true we add up all the votes and that determines outcomes of elections, but no one vote has any influence on, on an election outcome. Uh, this is an idea, by the way, that comes from Anthony Downs' book, Economic Theory of Democracy. That's Anthony Downs there uh, on the right. And in the center is Ronald Coase, uh, who uh, is um, the godfather of transaction cost theory. Uh, so uh, so uh, voters tend to be rationally ignorant because their one vote isn't going to have any influence over the outcome of an election. 
uh, and, and I mean, you know, thinking about this idea uh, of, of, uh, of rational ignorance and the, your vote counting, some decisions that you make have an impact on an outcome. Like if you go to lunch and you have a choice between pizza and salad, if you order the salad, you get the salad. But the same thing isn't true when you uh, make a choice on who you're going to vote for. Now think about the last presidential election. If you had voted for President Biden, who would be president today? Yeah, Joe Biden. And what if you had voted for Donald Trump? Then who would be president? Yeah, Joe Biden. And what if you just didn't vote? Then who would be president? Joe Biden. Voters have to recognize their one vote is not going to influence the outcome of an election, so voters are rationally ignorant. Uh, and uh, the, the people who have no power have no incentive to become uh, uh, well informed. I mean, some people are informed about politics because they're interested. Other people are informed by sports, about sports, because they're interested. But sports fans have to know, you're sitting in the stands or watching on your TV cheering your favorite team, that's not going to affect the outcome of the game. And it actually could be that all of the crowd together does affect the outcome of the game. But if you weren't there in the stands, what difference would it make? And the same thing is true with voters. Some people are interested in politics. Some people are interested in sports. But it doesn't do you any good to become more informed. Because, of, uh, of, uh, because individuals... Uh, uh, have no say in public policy. There's there's a discontinuity in political power that doesn't exist with economic power. So when we look at economic power, uh, some people have a lot more economic power than others, but it's a it's a continuous function uh, that when you take your twenty dollars to Starbucks, it buys exactly the same as when Warren Buffett takes his twenty dollars to Starbucks. Now, Warren Buffett has a lot more $20 than you do, but nevertheless, your $20 is worth the same amount as Warren Buffett's $20. And if you want to gain more economic power, there are ways you can do it. If you have an hourly job, work some overtime. Make a little more money, get a little more economic power. Take a second job. Or, good advice for you college students, Get a college degree and you can get a higher paying job. There are things you can do to increase your economic power. And so the economic power is, is, is pretty continuous. Some people have more than others, but there are ways you can increase your economic power. That's not true for most people with political power. There's a discontinuity in political power. Most people have virtually no political power. A few people, the elite, have a lot of political power. And the elite, again, going back to that transaction cost theory, they face low transaction costs. The lobbyists, the legislators, the corporate CEOs, they bargain with each other to make public policy. Most people have no ability to affect public policy. And so there's this discontinuity that identifies the political elite versus the masses. I mean, if you want to, there are certain ways that you can participate, but probably not going to have any effect. I mean, if you like a political candidate, you can make a donation to the candidate. That doesn't give you any more power. It does give the candidate more power. You can volunteer to work on a political campaign, but that's not going to give you more power. That'll add more power to, to the political candidate. Uh, if there are particular interests that you're interested in, you can join a, a, an interest group. Uh, if you're um, uh, very pro-Second Amendment, guns up, uh, very pro-Second Amendment, join the National Rifle Association. You can pay your dues. doesn't give you any more power. All it does is give the organization a little bit more power. So there's this discontinuity in political power, and the people who have little political power really don't have a good way to get any more political power. Uh, and so this rational ignorance that we were talking about, uh, voters are rationally ignorant because they know that individually they don't have any effect on, on uh, public policy. Uh, rational ignorance is a manifestation 
of that discontinuity in political power. That most people are rationally ignorant, those are the masses who know they don't have any effect. The elite, those people, they have an incentive to become knowledgeable because they're the people who make uh, economic policy. So political capitalism, those in the low transaction cost group, uh, design public policy to maximize benefit to themselves uh, as they engage in political exchange. Those in the high transaction cost group, they're unable to participate in, in those negotiations. The public policy they're subject to is the public policy that's passed by the political elite. The economic and political elite cooperate for their mutual benefit, and in political capitalism, increasingly, profitability of business is the result of political connections rather than satisfying consumers. Political capitalism is not the welfare state. It's not big government. It's not a mixed economy. It's not government intervention in a market economy. It's, it's defined by what government does, not how big government is. Uh, it's a separate and distinct economic system. So how, what enables this political capitalism? Um, not expecting that slide. I guess I'll talk about that. Capitalism and political capitalism. Uh, profitability uh, is based on satisfying consumer preferences in market capitalism versus profitability based on political connections uh, in political capitalism. But both are based on private ownership of the means of production. It's not creeping socialism. In fact, private ownership is the mechanism by which the economic elite uh, profit. Uh, both are based on markets for goods and service, uh, services, uh, but some of capitalism's most vocal proponents support business-friendly policies like tax breaks, subsidies, regulatory protections, trade barriers, things that undermine market capitalism. Uh, so, progressive democracy, the ideology of progressive democracy uh, is the political foundation for political capitalism. Uh, if, you, uh, if you go back to the founding of this country, this country was, was founded uh, on the idea of protecting individual rights. The ideology of the American government was protect people's individual rights. If you read the Declaration of Independence, most of it is a list of grievances against the King of England. He violated our rights in all of these ways. And so we have a right to establish a government to protect our rights. That was the ideology behind American government up to the late 1800s. And this idea of, of uh, uh, progressivism then expands the, the uh, view of the role of government. The progressive ideology uh, argues that uh, in addition to protecting individual rights, the role of government is also to look out for people's economic well-being. Uh, and uh, originally, if you go back to the late 1800s, this, this ideology of progressivism was aimed at so-called robber barons. I mean, in the late 1800s, for the first time in world history, People could start from nothing and develop huge fortunes based on market activities. People like Andrew Carnegie, people like John D. Rockefeller. And the progressive thought was that these people are using their economic power to take advantage of people who had less economic power. And so the progressivism said, let's regulate these, these robber barons, these capitalists, uh, in, in order to keep them from abusing their economic power and help out people with less economic power. But a key point to recognize is that progressivism as an ideology always was inherently redistributive. Back in the late 1800s, it was to, to uh, uh, impose costs on people who the, the, the uh, emerging capitalists for the benefit of other people but it's imposed costs on some for the benefit of others. As we move into the 21st century, that progressive ideology, the welfare state, uh, uh, helping out people less fortunate, um, the, uh, the progressive ideology still 
is anchored on the idea of imposing costs on some people for, to provide benefits for others. We'll tax some people in order to help out people who are at the bottom end uh, of the income scale, for example. So um, the, uh, the ideology of progressivism justifies taking from some to give to others. And the ideology of democracy justifies actions of a democratic government carrying out the will of the citizens. Uh, there are two views uh, on, on democracy that we might consider. One view of democracy, which was the view that our founding fathers held, is democracy is a way to peacefully replace those who exercise the power of, of government. And if you look at the design of our government, read the Constitution of the United States, it wasn't designed to be a democracy in the sense of do what people want. The Constitution defines a government of limited and enumerated powers. And the role of democracy originally is to decide who holds those powers of government. Indeed, if you read the Declaration of Independence, if you read the Constitution, Nowhere in either of those documents will you find the word democracy. A second view of democracy is that democratic government carries out the will of the people, uh, as determined by the outcome of democratic elections. And increasingly, over the couple of centuries that this country has existed, we've moved from that first view on democracy toward the second, to where now we think the role of government ought to be to carry out the will of, of the people. So this ideology of progressive democracy lays the foundation for political capitalism. Uh, progressive democracy, the, idea, the ideology of progressivism legitimizes providing benefits for some at the expense of others. The ideology of democracy says when democratic government does this, it's carrying out the will of the people. But, but look at what happens. The 99%, the masses say, we face these problems. The government ought to do something. Let's give the government more power to do something. But who runs the government? It's the 1%, right? So you're saying, ah, the 1% is abusing their power. So let's give the 1% even more power, and we hope that this time they'll use it for our benefit rather than, than their own. Progressive democracy provides the foundation for political capitalism. <clears throat> capitalists are capitalism's biggest enemies. Capitalism is a great system, but we need to separate out capitalism from capitalists who too often use the political process for their own advantage, often to the detriment of, of others. Uh, and uh, I have a number of quotations here from, from Joseph Schumpeter. Um, Schumpeter says uh, in his book, Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, he says, can capitalism survive? No, I don't think it can. And Schumpeter's reasoning there was the people who benefit most from capitalism don't step up to defend it. And indeed, when businesses lobby government, are they lobbying for freer markets? We want freer markets, we want less regulation. No, capitalists are saying, you know, give us tax breaks, give us subsidies, impose regulatory barriers on, to entry to keep other people out of our markets. Right? I mean, that, capitalists are lobbying for policies to benefit themselves. They're not lobbying in support of, of free markets. Uh, and, and again, you know, when you hear somebody saying, well, I'm proposing a policy that's pro-business policy. That's probably an anti-free market policy. Pro-business and anti-free market are almost synonymous. So Schumpeter says, uh, thus the capitalist process pushes into the background all those institutions, the institutions of property and free contracting in particular, that express the needs and ways of a truly uh, a private economy. Uh, here's, here's Schumpeter again. Uh, Capitalism tends to wear away protective strata, tends to break down its own defenses, to disperse the garrisons of its entrenchments. And we have finally seen that capitalism creates a critical frame of mind which after having destroyed the moral authority of so many other institutions, in the end, turns against its own. The bourgeois fortress thus becomes politically defenseless 
defenseless fortresses invite aggression, especially if there is much booty in them. And uh, Schumpeter again, uh, the capitalist process not only destroys its own institutional framework, but it creates the conditions for another. Destruction may not be the right word after all. Perhaps I should have spoken of transformation. Uh, now, Schumpeter was one of these people who was concerned about creeping socialism, uh, but maybe that transformation uh, that Schumpeter is talking about is the transformation from capitalism to political capitalism. And here's Schumpeter again. The essential point to grasp uh, is that in dealing with capitalism, we are dealing with an evolutionary process. It may seem strange that anybody can fail to see so obvious a fact. Capitalism, then, is by its nature or form uh, 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 or a uh, method uh, of economic change, and not only never is, but never can be stationary. Uh, so in this evolution of, uh, of capitalism is market capitalism evolving uh, into uh, political capitalism. One of Schumpeter's uh, great ideas, uh, he described uh, the uh, capitalist economy as a system of creative destruction. That new ideas, new products, new processes, new production methods arise to displace and destroy uh, the old. Uh, and so when we look at that system of creative destruction that Schumpeter described, that's that evolving system of capitalism. That creative destruction of capitalism helps people who are trying to get ahead. Entrepreneurs with new ideas, with uh, great products that are going to improve our standard of living, that process of creative destruction helps them to produce things that are going to displace the old way uh, uh, and, and replace them with something new. But that same creative destruction that helps people who are trying to get ahead threatens to destroy people who have gotten ahead in the past. So the beneficiaries of capitalism, the people who have ascended to the economic elite, now find themselves in a position where they're threatened by that creative destruction. And so they form an alliance with the political elite, the economic and political elite get together in order to create roadblocks to those people who are trying to come up after them. Creative destruction is great when you're trying to get ahead. It threatens to destroy those people who already are ahead. And that's why the economic elite wants to cooperate with the political elite uh, in order to create that system uh, of, of political capitalism. Is the name political capitalism, is that descriptive? Uh, and I've, I've had some pushback from people who don't like the term political capitalism because they say it gives capitalism a bad name. Uh, and uh, so, you know, here I'm distinguishing between market capitalism and political capitalism, but they both do have that common feature that they're based on private ownership of the means of production. Political capitalism then uh, has elite control over the political process. Capitalism may have a tendency to evolve into political capitalism. We ought to recognize that, one reason why I like the name. Uh, and as I say, the, the biggest threat to, to capitalism is the policies proposed by the pro-business capitalist proponents. We have to understand uh, the system uh, in, in order to uh, be able to control it. So how can political capitalism be controlled? Uh, and I think as we can talk quite a bit about this, let me just throw out some ideas and talk a little bit about each one. Uh, as I thought of, okay, there are three ways that we might be able to get this system of political capitalism under control. Constitutional constraints, democratic oversight, checks and balances. So let me talk a little bit about each one of those. Constitutional constraints. When you look at the founding of our government, the Constitution of the United States deliberately constrained the powers of the federal government. The Constitution says that the federal government only can exercise certain enumerated powers that are listed in the Constitution. 
And the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, says those powers that are not explicitly given to the federal government are reserved to the states or to the people. So there are constitutional constraints that were written into our initial Constitution. The problem is, how are we going to enforce those constitutional constraints? And what we've seen over the years, the decades, the centuries, is that those constitutional constraints have continually been eroded. So that the idea of enumerated powers no longer seems to hold much force in, in our Constitution. Uh, my, my thought is one of the big turning points here was the Supreme Court's ruling Social Security to be constitutional in 1937. Uh, Social Security came up against uh, some uh, constitutional issues, and the Supreme Court ruled that Social Security, in fact, is constitutional. Now, if we think about the Constitution as a document that gives limited and enumerated powers to the federal government, where in the Constitution does the federal government get the power to enact a compulsory retirement system? So I'm, I'm not objecting to Social Security. I'm not saying I'm for or against Social Security. What I'm saying is, if you read the words of the Constitution, there's nothing in the Constitution that even hints that a compulsory retirement system is among those things that are the limited uh, and enumerated powers of the federal government. Okay? So, I think constitutional constraints are a good thing, but the issue is how are we going to enforce those constitutional constraints? Democratic oversight uh, is that something that we, that we can that, that can control these forces of political capitalism? Uh, and uh, you maybe can get an idea of my thoughts from what I've already said. The masses have no power. And I don't think we can expect the powerless to control the powerful, even if the powerless far outnumber the powerful. So democratic oversight doesn't seem like a particularly productive mechanism for the masses to exert control over the elite. So I'm not against democratic elections. And in fact, going back to those two views of democracy, I think it's a great way to determine who holds political power. But it's not a very good way to constrain the people who have political power. Checks and balances. Now, this is an idea that's written into our Constitution. Uh, and so we're probably familiar from high school courses we had or whatever, this idea of the three branches of government, the executive, ju uh, judicial, legislative, checking and balancing each other. And I actually think there's more promise there with this system of checks and balances. Because if it's the elite who hold political power, a system of checks and balances creates competing elites who can check and balance the power of each other. So. That checks and balances tends to sit in the background of political discussion, but I really think you have to have checks and balances in order to control the power of government. You need to have competing elites who are able to check and balance the powers of each other. And uh, let me throw out an example to you. I don't know if this is going to be a good... I don't know how people will take this example, but let me throw out an example to you to think about this idea of checks and balances. What's the difference between Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin? Okay, so we can think of several differences, but let's go back to the last election. Donald Trump claimed that the election was stolen from him, there was an unfair election, that he should, you know, that the state should go back and look and find the votes, put him in the White House. Does anybody, and I'm not taking a side on pro-Trump or against Trump, but does anybody doubt that if he had the power, he would be in the White House today? That he, that, that he would have overturned that election and he would be in the White House today. But he's not. And why is he not? The reason he's not is there were other members of the political elite who had countervailing power who kept him from claiming the election. 
And again, I'm not taking a side on, uh, for or against Trump. What I'm saying is the reason he wasn't able to keep power was because they were competing elites who were able to use their power to put Joe Biden in the White House. Vladimir Putin does not have those competing elites. So I'm, when I'm thinking about this particular difference between Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin, Trump had competing elites that controlled his power. Vladimir Putin does not have those competing elites. So again, how can we control political capitalism? And, and what I'm saying is we, if it's the elite who have power, our hope is to maintain a system of competing elites. So let me give you some summary comments here. Elite theory explains uh, who benefits from political capitalism. Public choice theory explains how they benefit. And for the more academically oriented in the audience, I mean, there are two bo these two bodies of theory, they really haven't been connected. But if you pull them together, you see an academic foundation for this theory of political capitalism. The result, political capitalism, where economic and political elite cooperate for their mutual benefit. Profit increasingly is the result of uh, connections rather than producing value for consumers. Political capitalism is facilitated by the ideology of progressive democracy. The ideology of progressivism says it's okay to impose costs on some people for the benefit of others. The ideology of democracy says when democratic governments do this, they're carrying out the will of the people. But we have to recognize public policy is designed uh, by the elites. It's not designed by, uh, by democratic decision making. Most people have, uh, have no say. Capitalists' biggest enemies are its proponents, the pro-business pro people uh, who are arguing for these pro-business policies that typically mean anti-free market policies. Political capitalism, it's not the welfare state, it's not big government, uh, it's the power of the political and economic elite to design policies for their own benefit. And we're not going to be able to control political capitalism unless we understand it. Capitalism is being undermined from within. The, the biggest threat to capitalism is not creeping socialism, it's the cronyism, the corruption, and the favoritism that's pushing market capitalism toward political capitalism. Capitalists are the biggest enemy of capitalism. So let me close on that note, and I think we have time for a few questions.